We're going to meet, move now to considerations of contributory causation as it affects the upper extremity and the hand. And we'll talk a little bit about genetic factors and also some pre-existing factors that involve both obesity and diabetes. So we know from the labor code that the employer takes the worker the way she finds him. And we're dealing with primary causation and contributory causation, both important factors in the eventual assignment of impairment and apportionment for these people. And in the upper limb, we have to consider employment suitability because at the end of our reports, we're usually asked to recommend either further employment, rehabilitation, or different aspects of restrictions for this patient's return to the workplace. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the genetic confounders that enter into the picture when dealing with upper extremity patients. We have to deal with structural considerations and functional considerations. Now, structural considerations are important, but we don't see them very frequently. But when they happen, they do happen. Let me give you a, an example. If Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse walked into your office and applied for a job, you would have to understand that neither Mickey nor Minnie have five fingers. They only have three fingers and a thumb. Are you going to employ Minnie Mouse as someone in your office when each finger has to take on a 25% increased load when she types on the typewriter? So absence of body parts may affect all sorts of decisions associated with the injured worker. Probably it was a good idea that Minnie was not hired as a typist because she and Mickey went on to great careers in the entertainment field. Disorganized body parts or weakened body parts is another issue, especially the fragile patient with a weakened body part, such as a congenital problem in the lower back or a congenital problem involving the hand. And that problem doesn't necessarily have to be only structural. It can also include functional components. So if we look at functional considerations for contributory causation, we come up with conditions like HNPP, which is hereditary neuritis associated with pressure palsy. Now, in these people, they have a genetic problem with making myelin. Myelin wraps around a peripheral nerve and serves as an insulator and a protector, as well as a, a substance that increases nerve conductivity. And if you have a myelin defect based on a genetic problem, then you are going to be the kind of patient that comes to the office and you see that there are two scars on the wrist on each side where they underwent unsuccessful carpal tunnel operations, a scar on the medial aspect of the elbow where they went through an unsuccessful ulnar nerve decompression. And you might wanna wonder, does your brother have this problem? Does your sister have this problem? Does this run in the family? And they may tell you, oh yes, everybody in our family has carpal tunnel syndrome. And then you might be dealing with an underlying condition that is going to affect a contributory causation apportionment decision later in the line of your preparing a report for this patient when they reach permanent and stationary status. How about a patient that walks in with both a structural deformity and a functional deformity? charcot marie tooth neuritis presents that way. It presents as an ulnar palsy, but it's always bilateral and it frequently involves both the upper and lower limbs. So it's not inappropriate if you see a patient who has a slight clawing of the hand and an ulnar neuropathy, and they have it in both hands to ask the patient to take off his shoes. Because if you look down and you see a cavus deformity of the foot and clawing of the toes, you might be dealing with a family that has a myelin defect that's a genetic defect that creates Charcot-Marie tooth. And we're gonna see that in just a moment. Joint stability is another thing that affects the upper extremity. We're gonna talk about that when I show you another example. But the joint stability spectrum means that everybody that comes in with lax joints does not have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. The Ehlers-Danlos patient can take his cheeks and pull them out as far as his ears, but that doesn't always show to that degree in every patient with a joint instability problem. And those things play out for the upper extremity surgeon. And again, everything is, plays out on the social, economic, and psychological contributors to the disease or the injury or the final evaluation. Let's look at a couple of those patients, something like what Larry showed you on the imaging of the lower spine. Some of these contributing causation factors are apparent, they're obvious, and you can see them. Some, not so much, not so obvious, and you've got to do a careful examination to figure it out. In the top two slides, we see somebody whose family has Charcot-Marie tooth syndrome. It affects his feet, it affects both hands, and the clawing in his fingers is obvious. But if someone comes in with this deformity and you see this obvious effect, you'll immediately likely think 
of an ulnar palsy along the medial aspect of the elbow. If there are two scars in that area, when you start looking at it, you'll know that something may be unusual in this case, and you may want to look to the other side. You may want to look at the patient's feet. You may want to take a history that involves information regarding the family. But if this is true and you have to treat this patient, there's going to be a significant issue of contributory causation down the line. What about the condition that's not obvious? These are really difficult because you can't see anything abnormal. With someone who presents with heredity affected joint laxity and now presents with a functional problem in the hand associated with pain and inability to do her job. Let me review this case because it's very interesting. At about age 18, this young woman, now 35, became really hooked on CSI and she decided that she wanted to be a crime pain investigator. She went to college and got a degree in forensic investigations. She became very good at what she did. She was employed by the sheriff's department and the police department as a crime scene investigator. Unfortunately, she was too good at what she did because she was being called out every Friday night and every Saturday night and for every murder and every thing that the police department needed her for because she did better reports than everybody else because she was college trained in this field. So she shifted over to a specialty, fingerprint identification. Now that's something that's really important in this crazy world we live in. And this woman works a job where she begins work at 10 o'clock at night, works till eight o'clock in the morning, has two 15 minute breaks off, no lunch break in the middle of the night, and has to process using two mouse configurations, computers throughout that 10 hour period of time. She processes hundreds of fingerprints. Unfortunately, she does it very well, too well, because now she's developed pain in her thumb. She also has pain in the lateral aspect of her elbow from so much mousing. And she goes to see a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon who solves her lateral epicondylitis problems with an injection of PRP, but notes that she has pain at the base of her thumb. And he feels that she has an arthritic condition, but her x-ray is unremarkable. And so he gets an MRI of the thumb and that too is unremarkable. So his course is pretty reasonable. He sends her to a hand surgeon. The first hand surgeon looks the patient over allegedly examines the patient and gives her the advice that she should use a handbag that's a little bit smaller. It would, it would reduce her carrying requirements. Lo, lo and behold, that didn't go so well with the patient and she was sent to another hand surgeon who felt that she had carpal tunnel syndrome, but she doesn't, or at least is mild enough to ignore and doesn't cause her to drop things or wake up at night. But she was sent to me for a QME evaluation. And when performing an examination, using an old technique by laying your hands on the other person's hands and manipulating the thumb gently. And this is the area that hurt. She did not really have pain in the median distribution, really in the thumb. We find that she has laxity of the metacarpal phalangeal joint in the middle of her thumb. And with no pressure at all, I can hyperextend this thumb to 60 degrees. This is the reason that she's having hand pain. And the reason that she complained of pain at the base of her thumb, at the carpal metacarpal joint was because the intercalated segment deformity occurs and the metacarpal tips with the distal side going downward and the proximal side going up and sneaking out of the trapezometacarpal joint. This lady needs a stabilization procedure along the palmar aspect of her middle joint of her thumb to stabilize the thumb and put it into a position that you see here in your left. Now, when this lady comes to the full scale of her uh, evaluation, and she's ready for permanent and stationary evaluation at the assignment that comes along with maximal medical improvement, we have to consider the fact that she has lax joints, and that may play into our ana analysis of this patient regarding contributory causation. It wasn't obvious. It was pretty difficult. She was not diagnosed by three appropriate physicians, but in the meantime, we've got to understand that some of these considerations are not visible, but they do enter the functionality of the hand, and we've got to be prepared to deal with that situation regarding genetic laxity in a joint. Let's move ahead to the talk about obesity as it affects the upper limb. Certainly, obesity affects the spine and the lower limbs, probably more than the upper limbs. But every once in a while, somebody comes in who hasn't seen a BMI of 40 in a long time. She's soared into the stratosphere of obesity, and because of that, her knees have been destroyed and she performs upper extremity weight-bearing. She also works in a seated position during a work day and uses a computer throughout the day. However, when she stands up, she's basically a tripod. She has one point of purchase on the ground with her feet and her 
poor destroyed knees, but she puts upper extremity weight bearing down onto the walker that she's using for forward support. And these people also have other things in their contributory causation uh, table of contents. They have associated diseases, hypothyroidism, venous obstruction, and considerations of swelling because the conditions that we're dealing with are often dynamic conditions that change while the patient works. So a patient sitting in your office with no complaints may be a symptomatic patient when she begins using the computer or using the typewriter or using her hands for assembly tasks and swelling appears in the upper limbs, which puts pressure on the sensitized nerves in the wrist. So these are things that we have to consider when dealing with an obese patient. Are they upper extremity weight bearing? And are there other considerations that lead to nerve compression in the upper limbs? Now we know that there's a higher incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome in obese patients. If the BMI is getting up toward 40, all sorts of bad things happen. But we don't know whether or not this is a question that involves juxtaposition or causation. So I'll tell you a little story. Jennifer, my daughter, gave me a framed cartoon for Father's Day one year. And in the cartoon, two dogs are walking down the sidewalk and they're both on the end of the leash. And one dog turns to the other dog and he says, I think it's their opposable thumb that makes them act so crazy. And of course, this is a case where the dogs have noticed that adults act in a crazy way and it's because of their opposable thumbs. Well, the two go together, but they're not causationally related. And so we have to think about whether or not we're truly dealing with causation that is industrial when we finally evaluate these patients when they reach maximal medical improvement. In addition, people who are obese require special considerations. Let's look at the nerve in this woman. Was this nerve compressed by a workplace injury? And we see it right there. The serious bruising on the side of that nerve was not caused by a workplace injury. That was caused by the patient's 400 pounds pushing downward on both of her wrists. And that is the condition of obesity as playing out in the upper limb. The, the nerve is affected by weight bearing. The nerve is also affected by her work, which causes her hands to swell. And we have measured swelling when we put her hands through a stress test. So we've got two factors of causation here, and both are working together. So as this patient enters the AOE, COE aspect of the pathway taken by a workers' compensation patient, we have to ask this question. And if they pass the AOE, COE issue for at least part of the patient's presenting symptoms being work-related, they enter the system. When they enter the system, there are a lot of special technical considerations for a person of this type. As you look at this photograph, there are several things you're gonna notice immediately. Number one, the ulnar aspect of this lady's median nerve along the side, which is so blue and swollen, is probably not gonna get better with a carpal tunnel release. It may improve somewhat, but it's unlikely it's gonna completely improve. And so we have to have a forward-looking thought that we're not gonna get this patient better, we're gonna have a suboptimal result. Swelling, however, is gonna be influenced by the patient's workplace activities. And we are concerned because after all, are we gonna leave this median nerve under the skin and let the pressure come up from the, from the walker right onto the nerve without the transverse carpal ligament? Or are we as working surgeons going to devise some method of incising the transverse ligament from the radial border of the ligament from proximal to distal and from the ulnar border of the ligament from distal to proximal to create a Z lengthening of the transverse carpal ligament for this patient? We may have to do that. Special considerations for special folks. Are we going to use a turn down flap from the forearm to pad that with a flap of fat tissue that's about a quarter of an inch thick that will pad the median nerve when pressure is placed on that area? And if we do that, we find out that the flap is too fat because the lady is way up there in the 40 category of BMI. How are we going to debride that flap? Because we can't just take the fat off the top after we've turned it. We've got to turn it back and take the fat off the flap and then turn it again. These are all conditions that are absolutely. Uh, appropriate for the heavy patient of this type. When they finally reach the evaluation and rating portion, we've got to sit down and say to ourselves, what aspect of apportionment should be directed toward the patient's obesity and what aspect of apportionment should be directed toward the patient's eventual settlement that goes through the workers' compensation system? And we've got to think which portion is appropriate for each of these causational factors. And then when we write a report, with these people, we've got to understand that they are different. 
and future care and recurrence of their problems should be incorporated into that report as well. It's not all about apportionment. Let's take a look at the format we presented initially and try to think about this in the form of an obese patient passing through the system. Patient selection is the most important determinant of good outcomes. We all know that. Take easy cases, do them efficiently, the results will be good. But these cases are challenges every step of the way. On entry, we have to assess the AOA, COE evaluation. And if they pass the threshold, they enter the treatment phase. When they enter the treatment phase, we have surgical risks to consider and perioperative risks to consider. And we have special considerations, such as upper extremity weight bearing, appropriate cover, and complications that are always associated with extremely obese patients. And then finally, the patient reaches maximal medical improvement. And the evaluation phase is initiated with consideration of suboptimal outcomes that we have to explain so that other people will understand why this happened. We'll have to deal with the fact that some of these people are going to have residual symptoms. I don't think that the nerve that I just showed you is going to, by any means, get a full recovery from an operation that we designed to decompress the nerve. The damage is already done. The residual symptoms are going to be there, but hopefully we can minimize that. And the impairment calculation, it has to consider apportionment. And so we're right back to the format where we started from. How do contributory factors or causation affect the QME with the obese patient? And these are some of the concepts that we've got to live with as we create these reports and explain our reasoning for why we feel that apportionment is appropriate. Let's move to the disease factors and talk about diabetes, a very, very prevalent problem that we meet all the time. Diabetic patients are different, and that includes both insulin-dependent diabetics, IDD, and non-insulin-dependent diabetics, NIDD. And we're always fighting the HA1C measurement where we can evaluate the patient's sugar control and diabetic management. We're trying to get those patients down into an operable area. Entry into the system. With the AOA COE issue, are we dealing with carpal tunnel syndrome, both a static problem with compression, as you saw with weight bearing, or a dynamic problem that only occurs when the patient uses a hand repetitively, induces swelling in the upper limb, and develops a pressure neuropathy? Or are we dealing with a systemic problem? Or perhaps we're dealing with both problems simultaneously presented in the same patient. It's not unusual to see a patient present with both diabetes and obesity, which is why we the term diabetes in presenting this program to today. So in the treatment, we have to understand goal modification is important. You can't hit a home run on every pitch. Okay, only Willie Mays can hit an outside curveball into the right field stands. Anesthesia risk is important for these patients. Healing delay can be anticipated along with other complications. But now the patient has finally reached maximal medical improvement. And we have to accept the fact that if we're working with these patients, we're going to have suboptimal outcomes frequently, and we're going to have residual symptoms. And these must be incorporated into our reports and then dissected out for apportionment to non-industrial causation. Furthermore, we always have to keep in mind that this is a moving target. We have antecedent, concurrent, and subsequent injuries to consider when finally evaluating these patients. And once again, our opinions regarding impairment are always played out on a socioeconomic background, and we must also, also consider future medical care for these people. So here's a patient we'd like to present, and we'd like to present two things in showing you this patient. We'll get to the second one a little further down. However, in dealing with insulin-dependent and non-insulin-dependent patients, we know that it's important to preoperatively get these patients prepped appropriately and try to drive that HA1C down below eight, somewhere between seven and eight is tolerable and seven and below is wonderful. And we also know that the non-insulin dependent diabetics will do better. But in all of these people, there are certain things that we just have to accept. All the tissues in all of these people are diabetic tissues. They're not normal tissues. All diabetic nerves are fragile nerves. They go down sooner, they stay down longer, and they don't come up nearly as well when we do something that's perfectly appropriate and improves a normal patient. And all diabetics are prone to infection. A scary paper was published from the Mayo Clinic several years ago where they injected cortisone to reduce inflammation in the perioperative period, and they injected it at the time of the operation. 
They ran their series and their statistics showed that they had an 8% infection rate in carpal tunnel cases, which is unheard of because carpal tunnel surgery is usually free of infection for most people. So we can tell you that diabetic patients should go nowhere near cortisone. And hopefully in the future, we'll have some other drugs. We'll talk about those in a moment. Diabetes and obesity can also present as concurrent risk factors. So remember previously, I've, uh, I'm always enamored by formulas and things like that. And here's the formula the Greeks gave us for multiple variables and multiple problems. If two is whether they've got it or not, and n is the number of va variables, which is now diabetes and obesity, two squared is four minus one is three, and there are three possibilities. So this patient has diabetes, has obesity, and can have diabetes and obesity as concurrent risk factors. Well, that's pretty scary. So we ask ourselves a question. Could we operate on diabetic patients, not just consider them to be permanent and stationary and there's nothing we can do? Well, what will happen? Well, let's take a look at that because sometimes you can be fortunate in picking the right patient that can respond. I'd like you to look at this slide horizontally with pre-stress across the top images that you see and post-stress across the bottom of the images that you see. I'd like you to look upward from pre-op and upward from post-op. And what we see here to the left corner, the northwest corner of that slide, is a patient with impaired sensation where monofilament sensory testing is about 4.31 or 3.61 in areas that should be 2.83. A 2.83 monofilament here is very small. And if you can feel that pressing on your skin, you've got normal sensation. This woman has marked sensory impairment. And as we drop downward and get into the post-op stress measurement, things get worse. And on the left side, she drops into 6.65, which means you've got to take something that now looks like a pencil point and push it onto her finger with considerable force before she knows you're touching her. She's almost ready for surgical anesthesia. That's the secret. A serious dynamic problem that occurs when this lady exercises and acquires increased swelling in her hand. We operate on her in a relatively early phase because we know that those nerves cannot take pressure over a long period of time. If you look toward your right under the post-op series, both before and after exercise, we've got normal sensation of 2.83 in both the pre-stress and post-stress measurement for that patient who is a diabetic patient. So it's true that you can improve these people, but as has been shown in the surgical literature, if you're seeing patients with a mild problem, you've got a better chance of success than if you wait and they become a chronic and severe problem when frequently they won't respond to the operation that you'll be able to do on a normal person and get results that are much, much better than those that you're gonna get with a diabetic patient. Nevertheless, when you've got nothing, a little is a lot, and that's why it's important to consider these patients for early surgical treatment. So let's talk about some of the caveats based on our clinical experience in surgical literature. Diabetic nerves are fragile. As I said, they go down faster, they stay down longer, and they don't get better as well when you do something that's perfectly reasonable. Early decompression can be effective, late decompression is less effective, and recovery of function and postoperative stiffness, another factor of disability, is much more frequent in diabetic patients because of the intrinsic nerve damage. So these are the principles for a working surgeon. We'll get to the COA uh, course in, in just a minute for the, for the uh, AOE, COE, and the uh, permanent disability factors. But the principles for the surgeons are to accept the challenges, minimize the variables, prepare for the inevitable, and consider the biology of an impaired system. So let's talk about the workers' comp playing field and how that works out. Utilization review guidelines were not constructed for the diabetes cohort. They just weren't. The rule book was written differently and it's interpreted by people who don't always know what you're talking about or even what they're talking about, but they're working out of a playbook that's designed for normal people. But abnormal people or diabetic people, obese people work and they get injured. And there is no guidebook for those people who enter the game with an underlying problem associated with these areas of contributory causation. Number two, exceptions to the usual UR guidelines should be considered for this cohort, but they're not there, and that's unfortunate. The diabetic or obese patient may not be getting a fair shake because of that, and that's really something we should work on. Number three, of course, complete all aspects of a standard evaluation and modest conservative care. 
don't overdo it. Conservative care carried out too long is simply ignoring the problem. And you can't do it with these people. They'll get worse and they won't get better. And number four, avoid cortisone injections in the perioperative period for all diabetic patients. We're going to be looking at new anti-inflammatory drugs that don't trip the gluconeogenesis axis and the, and the Krebs cycle. And we're going to be able to use anti-inflammatory drugs without disturbing the diabetic cycle. But that's in the future. And this is one of the drugs we're looking at, polydeoxoribonucleic acid. And this is going to come into play in the future, but we don't have it yet. So number five, carpal tunnel syndrome is a low risk, low morbidity, reliable procedure. Do it sooner rather than later. Why? Because this is what we're trying to avoid, the chronic pain syndrome patient. If you allow pain to go on for a long period of time, the disability that we're going to see and the apportionment to these factors is going to be such an issue that we have created something that we really can't control very well. Avoid the real risk of delayed surgical nerve decompression. Chronic pain syndrome is something that we cannot fight with the ability and the reliability of standard operations performed on standard people. I'd like to tell you a little story about that, actually two. One is I called an adjuster about two or three years ago, maybe a little bit more, and told her that I was about to perform an axillary nerve block on a patient with a hand that looked like it was going into a chronic regional pain syndrome. It was about two weeks post-op, and the hand was cold, clammy, stiff, and hypersensitive. We knew what was going on and something had to be done about it. The voice on the telephone said, Dr. Braun, that's not authorized. It's got to go through appropriate channels to be authorized. I said, ma'am, I didn't call you to tell you that it was to ask you for your authorization. I called to tell you that I was going to do the block and that you're gonna get a report to describe why I'm going to do it, how I did it, and what I think is gonna happen for this patient. Once again, the voice said, Dr. Braun, that has to go through appropriate channels. You are not authorized to do the procedure. Kind of like my mother scolding me when I was a little boy. I said, ma'am, in my right hand is a 10 cc syringe with a 25 needle loaded with mepipicane. I'm gonna push that through the lady's skin onto the area around the subclavian artery or around the brachial artery and the axillary artery to give her a nerve block and knock out the superficial fibers that are dealing with the sympathetic nervous system. I'm gonna warm her hand up and get her exercising. And that's exactly what we did. I wrote the report the other day and I have no idea whether they paid me $35 for the nerve block or not. I know that I did it on the next day and a few days later. And I know after three nerve blocks and appropriate therapy, the lady's hand warmed up, loosened up, her fingers started moving and we got an improved result. Sometimes you just gotta do that. I know it's, it's a little pushy when you talk to an adjuster that way, but I just wanted to let her know we had a different cohort. These people are different. They have to be treated differently. About a year ago, we had a panel on what's new in hand surgery. And the panel moderator, Dr. Ladd, was talking about pain syndromes. And everybody on the panel threw their hands up, laughed about it, and said, well, what's the next subject? And so she left also and went to the next subject. During the question period, I was online to ask a question or to at least make a statement about this and time ran out, so I'm going to make it right now. I have seen as a QME in the last three years or so, more chronic pain syndrome patients, more reflex sympathetic dystrophy patients than I did in 50 years of clinical practice in San Diego. That's a scary finding. And what it's due to is the delay in treatment that these patients receive. So as treating physicians and later evaluating physicians, keep your eye and your heart and your, and your head focused on nerve compression syndromes and the people who present with obesity and diabetes. Don't let the monster out of the box. Don't let them develop chronic pain syndrome. Thanks very much. I'll turn this back to COA Central.